So good evening, everyone, um, and a warm welcome to this, which is the first event of the London Art Week Symposium 2021. I'm Tom Stammers. I'm a cultural historian at the University of Durham, and I'm also one of the co-investigators on the Jewish Country Houses project. Um, now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our work, and you'll see why it's relevant in a minute, uh, this is a four-year AHRC-funded project, which is run out of the University of Oxford, and which takes the country house and its contents as a prism for exploring the political, social, and cultural worlds of the Jewish aristocracy. So our core team brings together academics, curators, and heritage professionals, both in Britain and in Europe. Um, and we are very grateful to have a partnership with the National Trust who has been supporting some of our academic initiatives. Now, within this project, I'm working closely uh, with Sylvia Daverley, who is curator at the Strawberry Hill Trust. And together, the two of us are doing new work uh, into the history of Jewish art collecting. After the various delays caused by the pandemic, which we're all so familiar with, um, we have finally been able this autumn to hold two workshops around the theme of Jewish dealers in the 19th and early 20th century. These workshops um, have been put together in association with the DNA. Um, and so we had one back in September and one that is happening next week. And I should say, if you're interested in the theme of Jewish dealers, the keynote lectures from that September workshop are available on the Jewish Country Houses website. However, alongside these sort of closed events, we were really keen to do some public facing talks too. And hence, it is our enormous pleasure this year to be collaborating with London Art Week um, in order to put together this symposium, this sort of set of short talks. We are especially grateful to Emanuela Tarizzo for her enthusiasm and her interest in this topic right from our first conversation. Uh, Emanuela has been a great pleasure to work with. We'd also like to thank the board members of London Art Week for their generous support and also the operations team who so far are making things run fantastically smoothly. So thank you, Francesca Wumiato, Luce Garrigue, and our own project administrator, Brian Truscott. So tonight is the first of three talks this week. And let me say, for those of you who haven't signed up for the other two, please do go on the London Art Week website and you'll be able to kind of register for the other two. Tomorrow at this time, Biographer Jean Strauss will be in conversation with Caroline Corbo Parsons about the book that Jean is writing on John Singer Sargent and his amazing portraits of the Wertheimer family. And on Thursday, meanwhile, uh, Tom Marks will be chairing a roundtable discussion related to the heritage of Jewish art dealing firms in 20th century London. Um, this is a fascinating, complex, sensitive, and multifaceted topic, um, and we are so grateful to have some really wonderful panelists and contributors. Tonight, though, is no exception, um, and we're going to launch the symposium with a conversation around the recently published book from Brandeis University Press, which is next to me here, uh, called Belonging and Betrayal. Um, it's written by Professor Charles Delheim, and it has this very provocative subtitle, uh, How Jews Made the Art World Modern. I've been given the opportunity of reviewing it recently, and I can say that it is a completely engrossing panorama of Jewish art businesses in modern times. Um, and what's more, uh, and congratulations, Charles, on this, Kirkus Review have just named it as one of the top 10 culture books of the year. So this is a kind of lovely book to give in the holiday season. Um, Charles is Professor of History at Boston University and has published widely on topics from Victorian preservationism, I remember his brilliant book The Face of the Past, uh, through to the study of Thatcherite economics, contemporary corporate culture and even baseball. Charles's new book is truly epic in scale, I have to say it's engrossing but also kind of a huge panorama um, and so to help guide us through this material we are delighted that this conversation is going to be animated by James McCauley, um, one-time Paris correspondent and contributing editor to the Washington Post. More to the point, James is the author of The House of Fragile Things, the critically acclaimed study of French Jewish collecting families like the Reinachs and the Commandos. 
So it came out this summer. Charles and James are gonna to talk together for about 45 minutes before we open it up to questions from the floor. Do please use the Q&A function um, on Zoom. If you look at the bar, you should see Q&A there. Uh, please feel free to type things in while you're listening, or you can put your questions at the end. Um, but James will go through those questions in Q&A and put them to Charles after their conversation. Um, but for now, let me just say thank you, Charles and James, for agreeing to take part in this fantastic conversation. Um, and James, I hand over to you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Tom, for that lovely introduction of both uh, Charles and me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. Um, and um, thank you so much for joining us for what is sure to be an interesting conversation with, with Charles about his brilliant new book, which Tom has just told you all about. Um, so I guess we could start with um, a kind of basic question that's, that's on my mind and probably on many of your minds as well. Um, so Charles, how did you get interested in this topic originally? What, what inspired you to write this book, which as Tom said, is so um, epic? And, and impressive in its scope. What was, the, what was the spark of interest? Well, thank you so much, James, and the admiration um, is mutual. I loved reading The House of Fragile Things and learned a great deal from it. It's a really wonderful and beautiful book. So thank you for that. I, for me, I became interested in this topic for a lot of reasons. Um, as Freud would say, they were overdetermined. Um, I'd been interested in modernism and um, since I was a graduate student at Yale working with Peter Gay, and I also became particularly interested in the role of Jews in modernism, um, in particular because it's in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that certain Jewish outsiders come to play major roles as brokers and interpreters and producers of new forms of art and thought. What uh, really set me to look at Jews and art, though, uh, was both a family tie and historical events. Um, a couple of decades ago, um, my wife and I were in London visiting very dear friends of her family, the Kalmans, uh, the founders and proprietors of Crane Kalman Gallery in Knightsbridge. And I had a memorable conversation with Andre. Andre was the proverbially um, charming Hungarian, a man richly endowed with taste, humor, and um, himself an eminent art dealer, uh, one of the many refugees who had come to Britain um, right before the war. And at the time we had this conversation, I can tell you that I knew absolutely nothing about any of the people I ended up spending so much time writing about whether it was Rene Gampel or Daniel Conwell or Alfred Fleshtheim or Joseph Duveen. And Andre told me stories about this, which captured my imagination. And I don't think I would have ever written this book without that conversation. But what really provoked me um, to take on this project was the dramatic resurgence of interest in Nazi stolen art, which took place, as we know, in the late 1990s and has continued um, to the present day. Um, I was fascinated by the ongoing disputes about the ownership of major works of art, about the battles for restitution, um, but I was also concerned by the fact that so much was said about Jews as victims rather than as Jews as actors. And what I wanted to find out um, was how to turn this story on its head. In other words, rather than focus on the darkly enthralling story of how Nazis and collaborators ransacked Jewish-owned collections, I wanted to know how against all odds these outsiders had come to play a pivotal role in the art world in the first place. Or in short, how did they acquire so many great old and modern masterpieces? And what does this reveal about Jews, art, and modernity? 
I, I love that. That's such a, um, that's such an important motive. And I, I, I building on that, I want to ask you. Um, so you you mentioned that in starting in the late '90s, there was this considerable interest in specifically the question of Nazi spoliation and looted art and its recovery. But in recent years, there's been a lot of interest in Jews and art broadly conceived. That's not just about Nazi spoliation. So, I mean, we're here tonight thanks to the Jewish Country Houses Project at Oxford, which has had tremendous success. Um, you know, many scholars like Tom have done so much in the field. Um, your book, my book, I mean, there are many, many other examples of this. It really does feel sort of of the moment, a topic of the moment. And I guess, um, and, and by that, I mean, uh, again, Jews and art broadly conceived, not just the sort of the Holocaust period. Um, and what do you think has sparked that interest in this one um, kind of neglected, uh, traditionally neglected aspect of Jewish history? And why are we seeing that now, do you think? It's a really interesting question, James. And uh, as you know, a complicated one. Uh, whatever Jews have been identified with in their long history, they've rarely been linked with the visual arts. Traditionally, Jews have been regarded as the people of the book, fixed on um, the interpretation of literary texts rather than visual images. And uh, the second commandment, uh, with its rather ambiguous um, effect, um, no graven images, doesn't uh, necessarily mean um, no painting, no sculpture, no decoration, but that was the way it was interpreted in a variety of Jewish communities, but not all of them. I think that one of the reasons for the efflorescence of interest in Jews in art, and you can see this, uh, one of the, really the great books on the subject, Richard Cohn's um, book on Jewish art, which focuses on the actual religious objects as well as portraits of Jews is, you know, we live in a society, at least for the last two decades or so, in which there is renewed interest in ethnicity, in race, in um, culture, and in questions of heritage and patrimony. But I think in the end, um, it is the resurgence of interest in Nazi stolen art, which fired the extent of the uh, work that we are seeing now. And what I mean by that is, to paraphrase Leonard Cohn, um, in Anthem, there's a crack in everything. And what Nazi art looting and um, the delayed restitution of works of art really showed was that Jews were actors as well as victims in uh, European high culture. So if we can go to the first slide, please, Tom. Let me give you an example. This is Mooney's Water Lilies, 1904. It's one of approximately 250 um, water landscapes that Monet finished at uh, Giverny. Uh, this painting, along with many others, was exhibited in 1997 at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston at their blockbuster show, Monet in the 20th century. And um, I wasn't living in Boston then, but I was there to give a talk and I scurried off with my wife to the museum, only to find that the tickets were sold out and throwing myself on the mercy of a very generous young curate. So what's interesting about this painting? Well, this was neither the greatest nor the grandest picture exhibited in the show, but it surely became the most controversial. Um, it's signed in red paint by Monet, so its authorship was not in doubt, but the same could not be said of its provenance. Um, in the catalog, it is states simply that number 27, was uh, recovered after World War II and placed in trust with the national museums in France. And yet that apparently innocent notation manages to beg almost all the essential questions. Recovered how, from whom, why? Placed in trust for what purpose? And the answers to these questions 
take us to the bloody crossroads of art and politics in the 20th century. For what was revealed during the exhibit in part by an article by uh, Walter Robinson of the Boston Globe of their spotlight investigative team was what the Rosenbergs already had learned. Uh, this painting was plundered um, from, Paul, by, from Paul Rosenberg. Next slide, please. Um, somewhere around 1940, 1941. Uh, Paul Rosenberg and his brother Leon, so we can see in a moment, were heirs to an estimable family firm of Jewish art dealers who began in um, Renaissance furniture, old masters, but soon worked their way into 19th and 20th century painting, Impressionist painting and post-Impressionist painting. And um, as the war approached, Rosenberg, who was always deliberate and prudent, took care to hide his paintings in three different places. But all of these caches were discovered by the Nazis and water lilies was seized by um, Joachim um, von Ribbentrop, uh, the German foreign minister, who was one of the few Nazis who had the, the clout to um, collect modern art with impunity. And after he was executed at Nuremberg, the painting went to his wife and then eventually repatriated to France. And there it remained in the national museums until it was discovered with the help of the art loss register in London uh, around 1997. So what does all of this do to our understanding of the Monet? Well, it alters it. So this is of course a story in art history. It's a story in European history, but suddenly it becomes a story in Jewish history and that paintings like the Monet uh, become the last prisoners of war. And I think that awareness um, of this crack in everything has a lot to do with provoking what is thankfully very wide ranging interest, as you say, in a number of different aspects of Jewish owned collections. Uh, Charles, if I could ask, um, kind of building on what you were saying, um, you know, I, I, I love what you say about um, how we need to um, kind of take a step back and consider that Jews were not only victims, but also agents and actors in their own times. And that art is a sort of neglected lens of letting us see that. Now, my question to you would just be, what exactly, or, or for you, how would you describe what it was that these Jewish collectors, dealers, and even artists were trying to build? What was it that they were acting out through the art in that very fraught moment that they inhabited, the late 19th century and early 20th century leading up to the war? It's a great question. Um, for the dealers in particular, this is about the drive to belong, for affiliation, for connection, um, the drive to forge a place in French society, German society, English society, um, what have you. And this is particularly important because while Jewish emancipation um, provides certain kinds of political and legal rights, um, in principle at least, it doesn't guarantee social respectability or social acceptance. Uh, and in fact, emancipation complicates the lives of Jews because they suddenly have to find themselves negotiating or mediating between uh, their inherited traditions, um, religious practices, ethnic ties, and the very understandable desire to, to find a place in the world of what Ibsen called the compact majority. I think for collectors, um, it's a little different in the sense that, as you know, um, the collectors were more often than not, at least in certain cases, the very wealthy people who already had made um, fortunes and which fortunes which gave them a degree of freedom. But I think that for both dealers and collectors, um, fine art and decorative art provide a means of acculturation, 
Um, it's a source of status. Um, it's also a source of beauty, pleasure, and enlightenment. And um, I would never want to underrate the um, the aesthetic aspect of all of this. And but was also, there? Sorry, James. Oh no. I was gonna, yeah. Would you? Um, so I mean, everything that you're saying about acculturation and assimilation makes perfect sense. But was there? Um, was there a philanthropic aspect to these endeavors as well? Either on the side of the collectors or even in some cases, the dealers? There is definitely a philanthropic um, impact and motive. So take Joseph Duveen, um, mm -hmm. born in 1869, um, over a shop in the small Yorkshire town of Hull, uh, the son of a Dutch immigrant and he spent the rest of his life, in a sense, trying to forget or having um, others forget his own modest origins. Uh, following his father's example, um, Duveen makes a number of philanthropic donations um, to the Tate Gallery, the Wallace Collection, um, the, the National Gallery, the British Museum. And part of this is that he wants to become a trustee. He wants to be able to mix with the, the old and new social elite, um, the people who sit on these boards. But he also has a very strong desire to make art available to the public. And Duveen plays a critical role in shaping um, the national, the making of the National Gallery in the United States in Washington, DC in convincing his collectors, people like Samuel Cress and the Mellons to donate art. So I think philanthropy is very important. Uh, another example, one of the great American collectors, Benjamin Altman, son of a Bavarian Jewish immigrant who had a very modest and not very successful dry goods business in Manhattan. Uh, which he parlays into this magnificent department store with objects that are scrupulously chosen. And over time, and also with the help of um, Henry Duveen, Joe's uncle, um, as well as Joe himself, um, he builds an extraordinary collection, which begins with pottery, um, blue and white Delft pottery, um, and then uh, moves into old master paintings. And his intent was to create a collection that was encyclopedic in range in terms of different schools and styles. And in his mansion on Fifth Avenue, he builds this astonishing private museum. But when it becomes time to figure out what he's going to do with the collection, uh, Altman was a bachelor and he had already left his um, nieces and nephews more than well provided for. He decides to donate it to the Metropolitan Museum, which was then a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant dominion um, in which Jews were, were rarely present, let alone welcome. And why does he do it? He does it because he sees himself as a man of the people. And he wants the people of his native city and his country to have access to these beautiful works of art. So I think you're absolutely right. Philanthropy plays a big role here. Um, I don't know if you have if you have more slides to show before the next question, but I'm happy to. Um... Oh, I think we can just um, go through some more. Just go through them. I'll just mention them briefly, Tom. Sure. Um, I think we all know Picasso, who is one of Paul Rosenberg's, um, his, his prize artist, as was Matisse in the 1930s. And we see him in his studio at Rue La Boissy, which became the street for art in Paris in the 1920s and 30s. Next slide, please. Um, this is Paul's gallery, in which um, is a symptomatic of his desire to move avant-garde art from the margins to the mainstream in large part by trying to connect experimental works with the central tradition of 19th century French art. Next slide, please. And this is his brother Léonce, the elder brother, um, a man of a great vision who um, unfortunately did not have Paul's mercantile skills. And we can just go on and from there. 
This is Leos's um, uh, home, uh, which is relentlessly modern, not only in his choice of art, but in his choice of furniture. And then just go on to the next, please. Ready when you are, James. Oh, um, first, wonderful. Um, thank you for compiling them. It's great to see them all together. Um, I guess just to take a step back, um, I want to ask you one question that I got quite often in my research, and especially um, from archivists and other experts here in France, where I live, which was, you know, why I, in my book, which was, as you mentioned earlier, a study of French Jewish collectors, why I was grouping these Jewish characters together as Jews and not alongside their non-Jewish contemporaries, of which there were many. And as you, you just mentioned, you know, the institutions in the US like the Metropolitan Museum were full of, 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 of others um, very active in the, the world of the arts and fine art at the time. And you know, I have my thoughts on why that grouping is important, but I'd very much like to hear yours. What does grouping these Jewish dealers, collectors, and even some artists in this way allow us to see? I think it's certainly a very sensitive point, and I had uh, much the same experience as you did, um, more with art historians um, than with archivists, who were in some cases, um, for reasons I don't completely understand, a little put out by focusing on Jewish art dealers rather than on the art market per se. And one reason to do this was that my main interest was social and cultural rather than the economics of the art market. Um, but there's no doubt that apart from these kinds of more scholarly concerns, some in my view more justified than others, there's an awful lot of sensitivity about um, the phrase Jewish art dealer, Jewish novelist, um, um, Jewish painter, Jewish anything else. And um, you can see this in a variety of ways. Um, Ernst Gombrich gave a, um, a great lecture um, in London at the Austrian Institute on um, Vienna 1900, in which he railed against singling out Jewish participation in the arts. And for him, he said that this smacked of the same racial stereotyping as the Nazis, though admittedly the intent could not have been more different. And historically, um, counting Jews, branding Jews, stereotyping Jews, um, is a intrinsically nefarious and dangerous business. So I understand part of the sensitivity. Um, but I think that ultimately it's misplaced for a couple of reasons. You know, first, the fact is that in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, suddenly, almost out of nowhere, you have a cluster of Jewish dealers, collectors, art historians, critics, and not least artists. And since as historians, we always deal with change in time and with development, there has to be some way to understand this development. Second, like it or not, Jewish origins were a critical social fact. Um, they shaped, um, migration patterns, occupational patterns, marital patterns. Uh, they shaped um, who associated with whom and whether or not um, the art dealers and collectors that the two of us wrote about uh, regarded themselves as Jews or as Frenchmen, or to my mind as both, um, doesn't change the fact that they were overwhelmingly regarded as Jews and that their efforts were seen through a different lens. So I think that's part of it, but I think it even goes beyond that because what I think the story of art dealers and collectors of Jewish origins really shows is that there is something distinctive in modern times about the economic culture, the social position, and the cultural ambitions um, of Jews. And if you look at, say, modern art, uh, 
you know, what you see is a, a larger pattern that really holds true in a variety of spheres. There were a lot of reasons why Jews uh, gravitated to modern art. Um, timing mattered. Um, had they migrated in large numbers to um, cities, to metropolitan centers before the late 19th century or after it, um, they might have missed this whole uh, moment of uh, extraordinary creativity. Uh, and it was in these cities that were the crucible of these new forms of art and thought. But generally, Jews tended to do well in rapidly expanding endeavors um, in which there was scope for international trading, competitive advantages to family firms and ethnic networks. And the, the newer the enterprise, probably the better for Jews in the sense that it gave them a way to enter a realm in which professional hierarchies had not yet gelled and therefore discrimination was lower than in other areas. And that applies to Jews in modern art, but it also applies to Jews in say, the very different realm of theoretical physics. Mm. You no, know, you hear a lot of things about, well, Jews were good at theoretical physics because of the abstraction, uh, the abstract notion of Yahweh. Um, who, um, but I think this is really nonsense and the sociological ex explanation really fits. Um, in Germany, experimental physics was a well-established field in which like many other fields in German academia, um, notably um, classics and history, um, Jews were not particularly welcome. Um, physics, um, theoretical physics, offered new opportunities for um, adventurous Jews and non-Jews. And I think much the same happens in um, modern art. So I've been careful as you, as you have been in not trying to ascribe you know, intrinsic racial um, traits to Jews or making vast generalizations about so-called Jewish taste. But if you don't know these actors are Jews, much of what they did and much of what happened to them is just incomprehensible. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more and you, you put it so well. Um, but just building on the, the, the question of how they were perceived and also what happened to them, um, right. I'll talk to you a little bit about um, art and anti-Semitism and the relationship between those two things in this fraught period, which is a huge topic and a, a big complicated question. Okay. And you know, so many have written so well on that. Most of all, our very own Tom uh, with us here tonight has written brilliantly, brilliantly on this topic. But um, I'd love to hear your, your take. So um, basically, for just for our audience, just a brief summary, um, many, um, have, m many scholars have written about the way in which um, anti-Semitic invective in elites European society at the fin de siècle in the early 20th century had a sort of aesthetic nature to it. So Jews were um, depicted as foreigners because they had bad taste, because they were sort of, the, and the bad taste um, suggested that they were kind of ersatz facsimile citizens of whatever country they, they belonged to. And um, while Char Charles mentioned before that, you know, the, the art was a means of assimilation, it was also a means of uh, or a language through which Jews were attacked and otherized. So I would be curious, Charles, to hear your take on, I mean, would you say that Jewish involvement in and Jewish embrace of the arts eased or exacerbated the, the constant menace of anti-Semitism in this period? I think the answer is both. So on the one hand, um, the assimilation of the arts, the penetration of Jews, into different aspects of the art world suddenly provides them with common ground with non-Jews. You know, galleries and museums were essentially non-sectarian institutions um, in a way that churches and synagogues or mosques uh, decidedly were not. And 
um, aside from those Jews who decided to radically assimilate, that is to convert to Christianity, uh, whether out of sincere conviction or out of professional expediency, if you're trying to, um, to figure out ways of entering uh, the larger society, there aren't that many paths. Um, and the fine arts, I think, are one of the most important. Um, in his kind of tragic memoir, The, um, the World of Yesteryear, um, Stefan Zweig um, says that Jews became truly Viennese by their cultural participation. Um, this is what made them citizens. They had um, uh, collecting art, dealing in art, learning about art, creating art, um, gave them a sense of belonging that they were imbibing um, a national culture, or in the case of the avant-garde, um, trying to nurture and fashion um, new forms of art. And you know, if you look at the world of um, the avant-garde, you know, the avant-garde was, among other things, a social community, a social community of embattled artists and their champions. And the the fact that they were embattled, that they faced either you know indifference, scorn, rejection from the academy or the salon, um, simply brought them together further. And admission to the avant-garde in the sense that, you know, we can talk about it, that um, had very little to do with provenance, um, had very little to do with your religious origins, your ethnic origins. It had everything to do with your commitment to new forms of taste and new forms of art, to the ability and the willingness to um, experiment. Just one example, if we can um, go forward till we hit Conweller and his artist, Tom, may takes a while. Hmm. There we go. And Conweller is in the back left row and one of the other main characters in the book, Alfred Fleshtime, is in the, um, first row on the right. He's the man with the cigar. Uh, he always had a cigar in his mouth or his hand. So Conweiler is a good bourgeois. He comes from a financial commercial family um, in the Rhineland um, um, in Mannheim, which is about 10 miles from where my own family lived for a couple of centuries. Um, he comes from a home with relatively few pictures or books. Um, he's intellectually gifted, um, but he's destined for a career in commerce. And the advantage of this career in commerce was that it took him to Paris and then to London, in where he scoured museums and galleries. He immersed himself in different schools of art, different styles while reading literature and philosophy. And when he opens this small gallery on the Rue Vignon in Paris near the Madeleine in 1907, um, he begins looking out for artists. And the search for artists take him to the so-called Black Salon, um, the independent salon where he eventually uh, meets many of the artists that he comes into contact with and who he later champions. And through another emigre, Vili Uda, um, he uh, meets Picasso. And part of the relationship with these people was a social relationship. Sure, um, Conweller was their patron. As Picasso said, what would have become of us if, if Conweller hadn't had uh, a business sense? But the gallery was also a meeting place for Picasso and company and for many artists. And Conweller, who was a rather cerebral, buttoned up, restrained um, sort of fellow, um, troops uh, around with the artists to, into their favorite haunts in Montparnasse and uh, Montmartre. Um, and uh, what he discovers is that Bohemia was a nice place um, to visit, but he didn't want to live there. So he's really straddling this bourgeois world of his origins, 
uh, which helped make him this orderly, systematic, practical dealer with a real understanding of markets. But he's living in this avant-garde world. And I think that was an incredibly important part of the social experience of Jews in the arts. And I think when you come to the, the world of old masters, um, you see much the same in a very different way. Um, if Joseph Duveen had not been a, an art dealer who was buying and selling great paintings from the English landed aristocracy during this vast sell-off, which was precipitated by the financial crisis in the late 19th, early 20th century, he never would have met these people. And as it was, he mixes with them. The problem is he doesn't mix with them on an equal footing. In cricket terms, he was really a player rather than a gentleman, though he did everything he could to be a gentleman. And one of the things he faced was anti-Semitism. Uh, David Lindsay, uh, a man of great culture and knowledge who was the Earl of Crawford and Val Karras, um, resented Duveen as well as um, Philip Sassoon, said he didn't like to mix with Jews and Asiatics. So the other side of this, if on the one hand, art provides Jews with a means of um, entry into social worlds they, uh, worlds they otherwise wouldn't have inhabited, um, there's also, as we know, um, a very substantial backlash. Uh, we see it in, you know, Edward Drummond's um, Jewish France. We see it in earlier in Richard Wagner's Jews in Music, uh, in which, you know, both assume that Jews were imitators. They were materialists. They were incapable of understanding beauty. All they could do was possess. And the backlash we see is that Jews are seen as usurpers, as trespassers, and as competitors. And this surfaces in a lot of ways. It plays out in the 1920s in some of the tensions between the Ecole de Paris, um, many of whose artists like Soutin and Modigliani and um, Chagall uh, were um, foreign born Jews versus the Ecole de France, which was soaked in the soil of France and was considered to be a truly French art. Um, so that is um, a very thorough and concise answer to a very complicated question. So thank you very much for that. Um, I wanted to, so, uh, you, your vignette about um, Kahnweiler is actually a great window into the next thing I wanted to ask you, which is about the transnational nature of your um, uh, well-told but ultimately sprawling story. Um, so of course, so much of Jewish history turns out to be transnational history as we know, but specifically with your focus on the arts, what was the relationship between the cosmopolitanism of the characters and the families that you describe in your book and their particular tastes? Was there any at all? And what is, in general, what is the relationship of, um, uh, or, or, or I should say, what is the role of cosmopolitanism in the story about Jews and the arts broadly conceived? It's a very complicated and contentious issue, as you know. I mean, I steer clear, as you do, of making generalizations about so-called Jewish taste, uh, a term that was bandied about um, by the Nazis and by other anti-Semites. You know, the fact is there were certain Jews who were interested in old masters, others were interested in modern art, and still others were not interested in art at all. And in this regard, they were very much like their non-Jewish compatriots. Um, you know, cosmopolitanism, as we know, is a loaded term. You know, on the one hand, um, going back to Heinrich Heine, um, Jews seeking a place in the larger society wanted to um, picture themselves and think of themselves and be thought of as good Europeans and um, to be cosmopolitans. And there's no doubt that almost all of the dealers that I um, um, talk about um, in the story had a kind of international or transnational outlook. 
Um, the Wildensteins eventually had galleries in London, Paris, and New York. Um, the same with the Duvines. Um, uh, there were others like Conweiler who looked to Germany, um, the, whole, the, the nation of his birth, um, as a way of opening up new markets. Uh, these are people who are very mobile. And this idea of the mobile Jew, uh, of the wandering Jew, of the Jew who is here today um, and gone tomorrow, or as Georg Zimmel says in his great essay, The Stranger, the real problem is here today and here tomorrow. Um, so cosmopolitanism makes them suspect. Can we get back to... Um, Paul Cassira, Tom, and to the Berlin secession. There we go. Um, let me give you an example, the Cassiras. Um, Paul Cassira came from a very distinguished um, German Jewish family, um, born in Breslau where he grows up. Um, the family considered themselves members of the so-called Bildungsbürgertum, um, the, uh, the ranks of the bourgeoisie, uh, which prided themselves on Bildung, on the harmonious development of the self on a high degree of aesthetic and historical cultivation rather than on property. Though the fact is they were very successful in business um, in electricity and in a variety of other realms. Um, he goes off to university and this sets him apart from most of the people that I deal with, um, who in the first generation at least were almost entirely self-taught and who come to art dealing from very different kinds of trades. Um, uh, Joel Duveen sold vegetable products. Nathan Wildenstein was a horse dealer. Um, Alfred Freshtheim was a grain dealer. Um, Daniel Kahnweiler was a banker. So um, Kassira goes off to Berlin and with his cousin Bruno, um, before either of them have reached the age of 30, um, he opens his gallery, their gallery, which is dedicated to modern art. And next slide, please, Tom. And they become the secretaries, that is the administrators to this motley and amazing group, um, the Berlin Secession, the breakaway group um, who leave the academy and who are led by Germany's foremost painter, Max Liebermann, who was uh, much older and better established by these young men. Uh, what Cassira does first of all, and what the secession does first of all, is to import French Impressionist and then post-Impressionist painting. And that in itself gets them into hot water with conservatives and reactionaries um, who uh, resented anything French, um, despite the fact that they've been the ones who won um, the Franco-Prussian War. There's resentment about foreign imports. There's resentment against Jews who were not really German, try as they did to become German, who were importing these foreign goods and who were advocating um, new forms of art that broke with um, German tradition. And this either Austro-Bavarian art, um, or with you know, very traditional kind of classic um, German portraiture. So um, in, in one sense, Cassiro wins um, a great acclaim in avant-garde circles in Berlin. Um, the, the, um, the gallery becomes a meeting ground for artists, writers, critics, um, intellectuals, um, uh, men and women from business and the professions, um, who want to see what is going on there. But this kind of cosmopolitanism also puts him in a lot of trouble. Um, the Berlin secession, and in particular modern art, um, in Germany has a very different reception than it does in France. So in France, as we know, it is uh, rejected on aesthetic grounds, violating the canons and conventions of history, painting, um, uh, violating the rules of perspective, um, among other things. But it doesn't immediately have a political and ideological thrust to the criticism that comes later. 
In Germany, however, the opposite is true. Almost from the start, um, modern art is seen as politically and ideological, ideologically controversial. And um, Kassir's success in establishing uh, modern art with German museums and galleries is a bone of contention. So in 1911, a, uh, an erstwhile member of the secession, a landscape painter named Karl Vinnen, writes a tract attacking unnamed dealers and artists. The unnamed dealer was Paul Cassira. The unnamed artist was Max Liebermann for championing French Impressionist and post-Impressionist art. And the immediate impetus was um, the purchase by the Bremen Museum, I believe, of Van Gogh's um, poppies. And uh, Vinin was furious because he believed that these people were displacing German artists and putting them in great difficulty. So um, in 1914, um, good cosmopolitanism, good, good European that he was, Kassira, though he's in his early 40s, um, enlists and he's decorated for bravery during the war. Um, he's discharged because of ill health and he begins to write pacifist tracts, which get him into further trouble. So by the 1920s, when we get to um, uh, Nazi ideology, there's nothing worse than being a rootless cosmopolitan. And that is the term that's used for Jews and they pay a high price for it. Um Thank you very much for that. I think um, I'm going to get some questions from our audience at this point. Um, so let's let me just um, grab the first couple of those. Um, let's see. Um, uh, so okay. Charles, one, one of our um, attendees tonight asks you, in your research, did you come across any differences as collectors or dealers between the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jewish communities in the period? Well, the answer is no, um, in the sense that I wasn't looking in particular for Ashkenazi Sephardic differences. It's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, you know, if, say, if you look at, so just an example, if you look at uh, the family that you know best, James, in terms of the, the commandos and the, or um, their brethren on Rue de Monceau, um, is there really any difference between um, what they're trying to do and what, say, Charles Frusi is trying to do or the other collectors on the street are doing? Um, as far as I found, no. I think what is true is that Sephardim um, still commanded great prestige in France, much more so than the Ashkenazis. This really goes back to the 18th century and to the cultivated um, Sephardim of the poor towns like um, Bordeaux. And that really sticks. But otherwise, I didn't find anything. James, did you see anything uh interesting there? Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say so either. Um, I think you you said everything I would say. I mean, I think in my case, you know, the the Camondo were um, absolutely as invested as some of their Ashkenazi and then indeed non-Jewish counterparts in sort of restoring the to perfection the style of the French fin de siècle. So no, I didn't. Um, I didn't see anything to that effect in my research. Um, the next question from our audience is. Um, um, is, and I, and I quote, given this wonderfully full picture of Jews in the avant-garde, could you say a few words about whether you encountered Jewish figures during your research who were involved in the area guard, either as collectors or artists? If so, how would you situate them within the larger history that you've outlined here? I think it depends a lot what you mean by the arrière guard. I mean, there were certainly um, Jewish families who were traditionalists. Um, the Mosses, um, Berlin newspaper magnates, uh, when they commissioned a family portrait from Anton von Werner, 
who was a, a rather open-minded um, academic painter known for history painting. The family clothed themselves in ancient garb. Uh, it looked like they were attending a toga party uh, rather than being in the present. And that attempt to cast themselves in um, in an ancient light with a long and honorable genealogy and grounded in the classics speaks to this urge to belong and to be recognized as fully German rather than in any sense um, specifically Jewish. There were a great many um, Jewish art dealers that I write about and some that I don't write about as well as collectors um, who were interested in old master paintings and in, um, in Renaissance decorative art. Um, and of course, with the Afrusis, we know about the, the Japanese miniatures. But I don't think it's, oh, it's generally an either or. Some of these people um, collect both. They're interested in both. The lines are um, not as clearly drawn. So when Rene Gampel, one of my favorite characters in the book and the great chronicler of the interwar French art world, um, do you, does business with a variety of American museums, including um, smaller ones like the Toledo Museum of Art. And yes, he um, tries to obtain Rembrandts for them, but he also tries to obtain Picassos. So I don't think this is necessarily an either or. Mm -hmm. Um, another question is um, kind of following up on what we said before, Charles. Um, you've spoken on the impact of Jewish leader, or sorry, Jewish dealers on modern art and the avant-garde. How much did the gallery practices of these dealers shape the taste for old masters? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, both Kahnweiler and Kassira were, and, and actually Paul Rosenberg too, in a different way, were interested in interspersing old master paintings and avant-garde art. And I think part of this is that if you're trying to establish the work of a modern painter as a modern master, or to canonize that work, then displaying those works in the company of acknowledged masterpieces is a great practical advantage. Um, but there were also, um, in the case of, say, El Greco, who both Casira and Conweiler um, much admired and who um, had a, um, a moment of revival of interest in his art at the turn of the century, uh, they saw qualities in El Greco um, that were consonant with what they saw going on with, say, Cubism. And there are other examples too. Um, you know, for the most part, though, um, the burden or the uh, of the modern art modernist art dealer was to establish the legitimacy of new forms of aesthetic expression, and much of that depended on their ability to um, teach collectors and would be collectors how to look at pictures that violated um, or subverted um, fundamental rules um, and conventions of aesthetic representation. Um, so now, next we have a question from um, Tessa Murdoch, a colleague of ours from the Jewish Country House Project. Um, her question follows, were any of these Jewish collectors setting out from the beginning to gift their collections to public museums from the outset or were they subsequently nurtured by museum directors and curators toward that philanthropic goal? I think that's a hard question to answer in general. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned Altman. When Altman uh, walks into Henry Duveen's unprepossessing little shop on the Battery in Lower Manhattan, um, he is looking for decorative objects in which he is sincerely interested. And he begins to collect seriously. Um, he is prudent, he's thoughtful, um, he was slow moving, uh, which drove the Duveens crazy because they were constantly offering him works of art and he was, for good reason, putting them off. But I saw no evidence with Altman or any of the other people that I studied 
um, that they were beginning with the intent of um, donating those collections. Um, in the case of Altman, just to go back to him for a moment, um, it would be true to say that the director of the Metropolitan Edward Robinson and its president, J.P. Morgan, um, who knew something about art too, um, would, have liked, would have liked to have cultivated um, Altman um, so that he would donate his art. But that's not what happened. These were very, very different social worlds. Um, if you look at another figure, another of my favorites in the book, Heinrich Rieger, um, who emigrates from a small town um, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, studies medicine um, at the University of Vienna. And then this is the frightening part. He trains himself to become a dentist, which was conventional at the time. Um, he opens practices in Vienna and in a small town about an hour away. And he does this around 1900. Uh, at the time that the Vienna secession is flowering, this moment of the sacred spring, uh, the Ver Sacrum. And he begins to offer um, free dental treatment to artists who are down on their luck. And he couldn't have picked better. Um, among them was Egon Schiele, with whom he had a very close relationship. And uh, he soon began buying art from Sheila and from other Austrian expressionists. And um, by the end of the First World War, Rieger had the finest collection of Austrian expressionist um, painting um, anywhere in the world. Um, did he want to um, donate them to a museum? Well, I've seen no evidence of that at all. Um, he wanted them for his own pleasure and enlightenment. Um, he also want, he also opened um, his house and his dental practices to all comers so that they could see his art. Um, but he was at several removes from uh, the Austrian National Gallery, um, the Belvedere. And I think this is largely social. Um, he's a bourgeois Jew, a professional man. He doesn't move in these circles. He's not connected to the old power elite. So those are just two examples. But my impression for what it's worth is that um, there's a kind of interplay between the growing desires of the collector um, to make philanthropic donations, as you noted earlier, James, and by the understandable desires of curators and um, directors of museums to have these wonderful collections on their walls or their storerooms. So Charles, now a, um, a rather specific question from Mark Evans, a research fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Do you have any thoughts on the role of um, of Jews in the so-called discovery, in quotes, of tribal art in the early 20th century. Many of the key players, such as dealers, collectors, and theorists in Germany, France, and even the UK were Jewish. They certainly were. And there, you know, there was, as we know, an efflorescence of what used to be called um, primitivism. <laughs> Um, in um, early 20th century art, you see this in um, Picasso's work in a variety of ways, including a, um, a, an African mask in his 1910 portrait of Conweiler, which is a marker of Conweiler's um, good taste and his commitment to new forms of art. Um, certainly that one of the main characters in the book, Leons Rosenberg, Paul's um, brother, um, who had very wide interest and was passionately committed to Cubism, um, was also a collector of rare antiquities. I don't think he collected African masks. Um, and there were Jews involved in this um, quest, um, but there were also non-Jews. And then there's simply the role of what you might call inspired accident of um, business people coming back from Africa with all kinds of things, including masks, and these um, ending up in, uh, in flea markets or antique shops in Paris. So as far as I know, there's nothing specifically Jewish about that. I think there's a better case to be made there with um, the fashion for uh, Japanese in which there are several uh, major um, Jewish dealers, Siegfried being among them. Um, 
And lastly, the, the, the final question I'll take from the audience chat is actually something I was gonna ask you, Charles, toward the end of our discussion, and I'm glad that um, we will now have time for. This is from Josh Davis. Um, it, it returns to the question of looted art, stolen art, and then restituted art. And the question is, what were and what are some of the most important logistical challenges that contemporary Jewish families today experience when trying to recover stolen work looted during the war? It's a great question. Um, the challenges now are much less formidable than they were in, say, 1945, and in this period after the war in which there's an immediate flurry of interest in the recuperation and restitution of certain works of art. And there was certainly some progress and some signal achievements, uh, but there was also thousands, as we know, thousands of works of art that were never returned to their rightful owners or their heirs. I think what makes the quest easier today is that we have far better um, databases um, about provenance and that the auction houses and museums and the galleries, which were, um, to be honest, in some cases, very slow to acknowledge the fact that they were, knowingly or not, trading in Nazi stolen art, have stepped up and have provided detailed information. And we see projects um, at the Museum of Modern Art, um, at the National Gallery in the States, just to give a couple of examples. So there is better information. Uh, what makes it harder now is the sheer passage of time. Um, cases which come up now um, can are in some ways very can be very far removed from um, the scene of the crime, as it were. I'll give you one example. Um, 2017-18, um, the grandniece, I believe it was, of um, a Paul Lefman and his wife, German Jewish family, who were major collectors, filed a claim against the Metropolitan Museum for Picasso's The Actor. And as it, um, the, the case was, um, um, not decided in her favor by the first level of federal court, and then ended up going to the Second Circuit, where, as it happened, the case was presided over by a very dear friend of mine, um, uh, Chief Judge Robert Katzman, who tragically died last summer, and um, who was very open to the question of um, the claims of refugees. Uh, partly because of his own interest in immigration, partly he comes from a refugee family and partly because he was a, uh, a real paragon um, of ethical values. And I think the problem that arose in that case and arises in many cases is that the claims are, are filed very belatedly. So if this claim had been filed a generation ago or two generations ago, and families were still looking for the art, or there was a more direct connection with the art, um, that would be easier to argue the case. The other problem, which comes up in almost all of these cases, and has come up in several cases um, recently, some of which are ongoing, is how do you prove whether a sale is forced or not? Um, certainly, we know that when um, art is sold in Nazi Germany, in Austria, um, or in occupied Europe um, during the Nazi, during the, the period of the Nazi takeover and during the occupation, um, that when something is suddenly sold, especially for a low price, it's almost certainly a for sale. There is coercion. Um, if there's no gun to the head, there's the desperate need to escape. Um, but proving this is very difficult. And one final problem that um, collectors have is that um, if you don't have good records, um, you're at a great disadvantage. Yes, the great dealers, the Wildensteins, the Rosenbergs, the Bernheims, and many others um, had records that they could draw on to corroborate their cases. They also had very close ties to the museum world, the art world, and in some cases, political connections, which eased their way to an extent. 
Uh, for most people, this isn't true. I have a uh, family friend here, uh, German Jewish refugees. His father was on the kinder transport and ended up in Canada. He came from a very well-to-do family in Württemberg, and um, they were collectors of art. They owned uh, a couple of Bruegels, and he has tried to file claims um, and to register the loss. Um, but there's no simple way to do this if something doesn't come up at auction, doesn't come up at the art loss register. Um, but the interesting thing uh, about um, the story of Nazi stolen art is that it's an ongoing story that 20 years of later, after intensive scrutiny, um, after some signal victories and some defeats, uh, there are still plenty of cases out there uh, there was a wonderful exhibit um, in um, the Netherlands a couple of years ago, uh, which displayed looted art. Uh, but there's an element of contingency in what they what can find or not find. Um, well, Charles, thank you so much um, for your talk, for answering all of my questions, for the audience's questions. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here with you tonight to celebrate your remarkable book. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Tom Stammers at this time. Thank you so much, James. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so much, James and Charles. I'm trying to turn on my video, but without success, but you can hear me, which is the main thing. Uh, and the main thing I want to communicate is just a huge thank you to uh, Charles and to James for that really stimulating conversation. Um, amazing range of European reference, Charles. I love the story about the dentist in particular. Um, and I think my video is now coming on. Um, I also wanted to say what was brilliant is the way that you framed the whole question of why the Jewish lens is a useful one. That while it's a sensitive topic, while it's something that we have to kind of qualify, actually that this is actually extraordinarily illuminating as well so thank you so much for a very thoughtful and also brilliantly framed talk um so yes uh for those who'd like to learn more and we have scratch scratched the surface do track down a copy of belonging and betrayal um tomorrow night we have another of these sessions uh when we will have a conversation between gene strauss and caroline corbo parsons discussing the relationship between john singer Sargent and the Wertheimers. Uh, for those who are listening and would like to register, and if you haven't already, please have a look at the London Art Week website and you will be able to find the link there. Um, but let me end by saying a huge thanks again to Charles and James for a brilliant discussion. Um, thank you all for listening. It's wonderful to see this big audience um, and I hope everyone has a very good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.